Thanks. Uh, so I'm Ben. I'm pretty excited to be here talking today about truck hacking. I'm going to introduce you to commercial transportation, show you why it matters. We're going to be talking about trucking in particular, so trucks and trailers and distribution centers, etc. Uh, then we're going to get into the technical details of the three main vehicle networks that are found on trucks today. In the second half of the talk, I'm going to do a review of some of the public attacks on trucks, and I'll highlight areas where we could use some more hacking. So there's definitely room for your own research and I'll give you some ways to get involved. Then we'll wrap up the session by looking at some concrete examples of using tools to interact with the vehicle networks. And I'll also give you a whole list of tools that you can go and get and play with yourself. Just a very little bit about me. I'm a, a cybersecurity research engineer, contractor at the NMFDA. I have some previous experience in embedded systems design and reverse engineering. I'm also proud to be a cyber truck challenge instructor and a volunteer at the uh, DEF CON hardware hacking villages and uh, car hacking villages. So commercial transportation, what is it? A very broad topic, all possible transportation of goods or people for a business purpose, just about anything. Uh, it makes up you know, trailers, trains and ships, which you can see pictured here. Also cargo containers, uh, which is called intermodal is a big part. And we'll talk about that. Why does commercial transportation security matter? Uh, look around the room you're in right now. If you bought it, it came on a truck. Uh, truck problems are big problems for society. And uh, if you need to be convinced, I encourage you to take a look at A Week Without Truck Transport at IRU.org. It's amazing just how deep the supply chain of trucking goes. There are some communities that even need to get their drinking water from trucks. And then probably most obviously, trucks are the big lumbering giants on the road and uh, safety issues with trucks are all of our issues. If you think about all the modes of transportation and not just trucking, it matters because we're all linked by that global supply chain, but also because all the technologies are shared among the different modes. So a vector of an attack in one mode can actually be an attack across the board. Uh, for example, the CAN bus hack research that demonstrates engines disablement via D-rate abuse is actually applicable across all the modes because diesel is found in all the modes. And we're going to talk about that a little more later. So trucks, uh, pictured here in this spaghetti diagram, they have a lot of features, a lot of connectivity, and they have a lot of variations. Uh, trucks are actually leave the factory today, sometimes with three different cellular modems installed. The particular components and specs of a truck are built to order by the fleets, which accounts for all the variation. These trucks actually use multiple different vehicle networks and sometimes multiple segments of the same network to accomplish all the features that are necessary. Um, this diagram you can see is, is showing three different types of networks, three connectors, a whole bunch of different components. One of the things we're not picturing this diagram is components that bridge multiple segments other than that gateway because doing so would make it a bit more of a spaghetti mess. But those types of components, the bridge segments are also present. And take note of the connectors here. The J560 connector is, the, uh, is what's used to make the umbilical connection between the tractor and the trailer. That OBD connector is the uh, regulated onboard diagnostics connector found in all trucks. And then the RP1226 is a newer connector, but was put there because um, Permanently connecting devices such as telematics or other aftermarket is not recommended for the OBD connector. So the OEMs place that there to give fleets a place to put their permanently or semi-permanently installed equipment. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying, these trucks, they exist as money makers. If they're not rolling, then the fleet is losing money. So what about trailers? The other things that roll, they actually outnumber tractors in North America. They have plenty of features. Uh, what you see pictured here is a summary of the features you'll find in a trailer based on questionnaires that we put to our fleets. They all have trailer ABS, unsurprisingly, because that's regulated. Uh, there's also other features, and the other features are usually integrated with wireless proprietary, but there are other proprietary type networks that will enable those features as well. And uh, it seems like there's still quite a bit, quite a bit more than just trailer brakes. These features aren't stopping there though. They're growing every day. Uh, this is a conglomerate of future looking features that you might find in a trailer based on a bunch of webinars by uh, Paul Menig and the people that he invited into uh, ATA TMC task forces, combined with some of the questionnaires that we put to our members. And you can see it's 
quite a lot of features, quite a lot of different bus options. Um, note that the adoption of these technologies has been pretty slow. A lot of these things that you'll see here have actually been listed as next generation technologies in a report that uh, dates to 1998. So take the marketing with a grain of salt, but um, these kind of technologies are coming as are the switch to a different bus. You'll see here we're listing CAN J1939 as well as ISO 11992-2, which is also known as TT CAN. These CAN buses and trailers are much more common in Europe. Uh, in North America today, they're pretty rare, but that may very well change uh, in the future. And then uh, an important thing to mention is that if you thought getting testing time on a truck was hard, imagine getting testing time on a trailer. If these trailers uh, aren't rolling or docked, they're actually uh, parked holding cargo. So getting time on a trailer is pretty difficult. Uh, and the trailers last a really long time. They stay of a service lifetime of about 30 years in North America. So a lot of the trailers you'll run into are quite old, maybe beaten up and have seen better days. So trucking, uh, you know, goes without saying, I think I said it before, uh, it's a money maker. The vehicles are owned for commercial purposes. Uh, sometimes they're leased for companies, for example, Penske. And they, uh, they protect their investments with preventative maintenance. So maintenance is a big part. Uh, tractors actually spend more time in a service center connected to diagnostics than any passenger car would. Uh, the diagnostic software is quite powerful. Uh, you know, uh, you can see that paper reference there that Bill Haas was on. The, the diagnostic software, for example, is capable of disabling engine cylinders and cycling ABS pressure valves. And a lot of this diagnostic software is actually just low quality Windows software. Uh, another big part about trucking is the distribution centers. So fleets actually make extensive use of these. Uh, for example, in LTL, less than truckload, where these distribution centers are called terminals and moving freight there is much more like moving passengers and air traffic um, than it is like packets in a network. Packets in a network is more like truckload. So you can also think of LTL as how the postal service operates and these terminals end up being staging areas for different groups of uh, passengers as they get regrouped into different trailers and sent on to their next destination. These distribution centers actually have a lot of technology and a lot of attack surface themselves, which I'm not prepared to talk about, but it should be unsurprising to you to find that handhelds and tablets and IOT and all the other embedded systems actually pervade the distribution center today. Intermodal briefly, a lot of people recognize intermodal as containers. Um, a lot of fleets make extensive use of them, transferring them from train to ship to trailer as they're designed to do. We've heard that some intermodal containers actually have their own networking inter interconnects, and many of these containers have their own telematics mod modems. So just another way that things are all interconnected. Um, I'm not an expert in the other modes here, but it's important to let you know what they are and that they all share technologies. So ships also use j 39 and there it's called NMEA. Uh, trains also use J1939 because they have a diesel engine, although on the trains, a lot of times the diesel engine is set up as a generator and not as a, not as an engine to move the, uh, as a motor to move the train. And another thing that all the modes share in common is they're all kind of accreting all of this IoT stuff and adding them onto their business operations. You can see here a picture of a, a port that has all kinds of handhelds and different sensors and integration with the ships that dock, much like a distribution center. So I hope I've convinced you that commercial transportation is important and that the other, all the other modes are interrelated. I'd like to move into discussing particulars of truck vehicle networks, starting with J1939. I think a lot of people here uh, joining the Car Hacking Village are gonna be familiar with CAN networks, especially as they relate to passenger cars. So I'd like to introduce you to J1939, which is found in heavy vehicles as it relates in an analogy to passenger cars. So in both cases, the CAN buses are encoding time varying signals and packing those time varying signals into bit field locations. In passenger cars, the bit field locations are, you know, signals that are identified by these arbitration IDs and both the arbitration IDs that identify the group of signals and the locations of those signals as they're packed are proprietary information. In J1939, in contrast, PGNs that identify the grouping of signals and the SPNs that identify where they're packed are the standardized parts, in fact, in J1939, for the most part. In passenger cars, uh, diagnostics were standardized. This is mostly for CARB. And in contrast, 
in heavy vehicles, it's actually the diagnostics that are proprietary. Um, so in passenger cars, you should be familiar with UDS for diagnostics. Uh, trucks have more than one type of diagnostic. UDS is available and is gaining a uh, share. It has its own reserved PGN, for example. Here's a nice little decode of a CAN frame that is encoding a J1939 seed key exchange. Uh, this was put together using Ken Tyndall's uh, CAN2 decoder, which is great at looking at extended errors um, and does a really nice breakdown and buildup of the parts of the frame. You can see here that J1939 frames use extended 29-bit arbitration IDs, which is the combination of IDA and IDB that you see there. They can have a variable data field, in this case three, and then have all the normal CAN parts. There's also a diagram below showing you how the PGNs are actually packed into that arbitration ID. So there's both unicast and broadcast PGNs. When we're talking about a broadcast PGN, it uses all of the bits from 23 to, to 8. And for a unicast, it actually just uses the upper bits and encodes the destination address in that arbitration ID. And in all cases, the arbitration ID also encodes a source address and a priority, as well as one reserve bit and a page that is starting, a page bit that's starting to be used more extensively in J1939 definitions. J1939 has a lot of different features. I told you it has unicast and broadcast. It also has its own transport, fragmentation, and reassembly mechanism, address claiming, request to PGN data. And then more importantly to truck hacking, there's proprietary messages that flow over J1939 networks, and they have their own reserved range of PGNs, both unicast and broadcast. When you're dealing with trucks, a lot of the, the fun stuff, the dumping and reconfiguring and reflashing, is all protected by authentication and authorization challenge response system called seed key exchange. And the UDS is used for um, seed key exchange. It has a reserved PGN of uh, hex DA00. And you saw some of that encoded in the previous slide. So let's talk about where you might be able to find J1939 on a truck. First up is that onboard diagnostics connector. These can be found in either black or green. They're located below the steering wheel, just to the left of it. Uh, they're usually this Deutsch 9-pin, although some OEMs actually use the passenger car style OBD2 connector. On the black socket, you'll find that in addition to J1708, there's actually two J1939 buses. Uh, the second one is optional. And on the black socket, J1939 runs at 250 kilobaud. On the green variety, uh, the J1708 bus is actually optional replaced usually by J1939. And the J1939 buses on the green socket run at 500 kilobaud. Now those OEM specific pins that you see pictured there, those are also probably another J1939 bus on many of the vehicles. Finding J1939 on the RP1226 aftermarket connector, it should be present on pins two and nine and four and 11. Remember this is the um, aftermarket or telematics connector that you might find behind the dash or behind the berth. This was provided by OEMs to give fleets a place to connect things permanently or semi-permanently that wasn't the OBD connector. Notice here that there's also two OEM specific pins. Those are probably also a J1939 bus. Uh, in addition, uh, many modern vehicles have lots of different J1939 segments that are not pinned out on the onboard diagnostics connector. This architecture diagram you see here is from a textbook by Duffy and Wright, and it shows no less than six separate CAN segments, only two of which are present on that diagnostics connector. So you'll probably be able to find more J1939 if you poke around in the harnesses of the truck. Last, uh, finding J1939 is gonna be possible on DB15 connectors. Many of the adapter cables that you'll use on heavy vehicles are pinned out on DB15 connectors. So knowing this pinout is really useful. CAN is present on five and 10 and 12 and 13. So that was J1939. Let's talk about 1708 and 1587. Uh, these two standards are pretty much always found together. Um, they predate J1939 by many years. They're sometimes still found in tractors and they're always still found in the trailer as J2497, more on that later. You can see here this analogy diagram that tries to roughly place where J1587 is 
uh, relative to where J1939 or say UDP would sit on top of Ethernet, just so you can get an idea of the place in the, the stack up of these different standards. So J1708 uh, has a very similar bus arbitration to CAN, the lowest byte first wins. J1708 always runs at 9600 baud, uh, eight bits, one stop bit, no parity, so eight and one. At the physical layer, it's very much like RS-485, but it has hard real-time constraints for framing and bus arbitration. So if you wanna write J1708, you have to actually have um, hard real-time hold-offs for frame delimiting. If you just wanna read J1708 and dump it, uh, any RS-485 adapter should do. In J1708, that first byte is um, called the MID, and it's much more like a source address than arbitration IDs are on CAN. And there's many sort of noteworthy MIDs. Uh, 111 is factory test, and that's fun. Uh, there's also offboard diagnostics, uh, programming. There's a vehicle security reserve number. There's bridges for drivetrain as well as tractor trailer. Uh, and then uh, four total J2497 reserves. So there's 10 and 11, which is the lamp on, lamp off. That's the whole raison d'etre for J2497. Um, for 128 through 255, those are actually defined by the J1587 standard. So J1587 signals are identified by a PID byte, which gets put into the payload of the J1708 frame. This is kind of different than J1939 or passenger cars, where maybe the PGN implicitly specifies the bit packing. Um, these signals are identified by a PID that's put in the frame. And then how you decode the data that follows the PID that's where you have to refer to the J1587 specification. And of course, there are tools out there that can take the SAE PDF um, and do a decode, like Pretty 1587. And we'll talk a bit about that later. J1587 has a lot of features. Both broadcast and unicast frames are, are possible. There's ways to request data, uh, both requesting broadcast data as well as component-specific data. It includes fragmentation and reassembly, both a transport protocol that's unicast and a uh, special multi-section parameter, PID 192, for PIDs that are broadcast. There's also a free form data standardized request that sits on top of the transport protocol where you can ask for interesting things like programmable parameters and calibration and executable code. There are, of course, uh, since it's automotive, proprietary messages and the proprietary messages where the fun stuff happens. In 1587, this is called data link escape, and these are unicast. So they're made up by PID 254 and 510. Uh, an example message you might see is, you know, ACFE 80 FO 17 down here, which is a 254 PID being sent from MID hex AC to MID hex 80. And the payload FO 17 is what gets interpreted by the destination on the other end. Where will you find 1708? You saw this already on a couple of the Deutsch nine pin connectors. J1708 should be present on F and G on that black socket and it'll be optional on the green socket. If you have an RP1226 connector, you may very well have access to a 1708 bus on pins six and 13. And of course, if you have a DB15 cable adapter, you're probably gonna find your 1708 bus on pins 14 and 15. So we have reviewed the locations where it's possible to find 1708 or 1587, but the presence of this bus is becoming increasingly uncommon on tractors. The reason why it's relevant, why we cover it here, is because um, this network does show up on powerline carrier form in all tractors since 2001. Let's talk about that form. It's known as J2497, and it's what links tractors and uh, trailer ABS. Roughly speaking, J2497 is J1708 over trailer power lines. It's also known as PLC for trucks. And you can think of it as an alternative transport layer for 1587. Um, the way it works is uh, it's almost exclusively implemented by the Intel on SSC P45 chip, which adds a preamble and uh, sync bits around the beginning and the end of J1708 messages. And this is a bi-directional um, switch. You can also see a time domain plot at the bottom of the kind of chirps that it puts together. Uh, J2497 has a lot of features itself. The primary purpose is for those MID 10 and 11 uh, frames, you know, OAOO and OBFF are the, the default frames for lamp on and lamp off. That's the whole reason why they developed it. But because it is 
J1708, it has all of those features. Plus, they also had a dynamic address claim to support having um, road trains, so multiple different trailers connected together. Uh, because this is a data network, the trailer brake manufacturers put together trailer brake diagnostics. So all the ABS air pressure valve cycling and ECU reconfiguration uh, should be present over 2497. And some of those brake ECUs and trailers actually have their own scripting languages uh, that are programmable over J2497. So one of the interesting things about this network is because of that added preamble that that chip adds to the beginning of the message, there's a duplication of the first byte being the MID byte. You can actually create priority override frames. So for example, you can, you can send a maximum priority double zero and a J1708 inside it as a minimum double F and that double zero frame will override the priority of all the traffic, but it's received as a MID double F. And then finally, because this is a power line character, uh, carrier technology and it, it uses very long conductors, uh, we have been able to receive this using the SDR software from six feet away from the trailer. So where are you gonna find J2497? Well, it's always gonna be on that power pin, the center pin, aux on the J560 connector at the back of the tractor or the front of the trailer, pictured on that green cable in the top right, um, which means all the adapters in the bottom left are, are your friend. So you might find some adapters that give you a DB15 power right out to the J560 as pictured in the bottom left. There are inline adapters um, next from the left. That's, you have to be careful. Some of them actually include an Intelon chip, so they will convert from 2497 to 1708. Some of them don't. You can also make your own inline adapter by taking the uh, shell off a J560 cable and inserting your own pigtail, as you can see pictured there, second from the left. You might also find J2497 on the power pins of the diagnostics connector, that uh, OD OBD connector, the Deutsche 9 pin. But you have to be careful. Uh, some trucks include filtering so that the diagnostics connector is actually got filtered power relative to what you'd find on the tractor. Uh, same uh, for 2497 on the RP1226 connector. So the RP1226 document says that it should be there. All the OEMs that I've ever talked to in meetings say that it probably won't work. It probably is filtered. So you may or may not find it on the RP1226 connector. Uh, 2497 might actually be on the battery terminals of the truck, which makes this adapter useful sometimes, but it may also be filtered. The only place it's guaranteed to be found is on that tractor connected to the J560. But have no fear, um, you might just be able to set up an active antenna and some SDR software and receive the traffic standing next to the trailer anyways. Of course, there is gonna be other uh, vehicle networks in intermodal. Um, we know that J1939 is gonna be found anywhere there's a diesel engine. And since J1939 historically replaces J1708 and 1587. It uh, stands to reason that there may be installations that also have J1708 on their diesel engines in intermodal. We've also heard that J2497 might be used for power line communications on some containers, but haven't been able to test this yet. In the future, uh, of course, as applications for, for high-speed data uh, keep increasing, uh, the number of buses and types of buses that'll be deployed will go up. Some of the ones not listed here, uh, you might find in passenger cars like Flexray, most. Um, in heavy, it looks like CAN FD may or may not make it in. Uh, CAN HG looks like a good option to, uh, to avoid the incompatibilities. Automotive Ethernet seems pretty clear that it'll find applications on trailers. And of course, the proliferation of different wireless technologies is inevitable on these vehicles. Okay. So that was an overview of what trucking is, how it works with the technicals. Let's talk about truck hacking. Starting off with the can attack methods. So if you actually have access to a can bus, what can you do? Um, if you're thinking at the frame level, how you create the can messages, you can flood the bus. That's a pretty obvious one. And I think there's lots of examples of that in the literature, or you can just send a message that you want um, and pretend that you were the, the intended source, and that's uh, spoofing, but might be known by other names. All of the types of attacks that we're going to discuss in this section are all just simple spoofing attacks, so sending data, pretending that you're the ECU that you want to be. But there's more than that. Um, 
there's a lot of different ways to attack the protocol level, uh, sort of below the payloads and the arbitration ID you might create using something like socket can. So both the can hack tool by Ken Dindell and the can't tool by uh, Bitbane and N2 at Grimm are capable of doing things like bus off attacks, uh, spoofing immediately after a frame goes by. So you can be sure that the receiver buffer will get it as soon as possible. And if the receiver uses timed receiving, then you can actually replace the message. Uh, they're capable of causing double receive of messages, overload frames. Uh, there's a way to force transmitters into error passive and then replace the data or spoof the data. And then this type of an attack that's uh, Janus, which uh, exploits the fact that different sampling points can be configured on CAN receivers. So you can create a waveform that um, is received with different data by different configured sampling points. And then of course, things like bus shorting and NAC data replacers. So those last three actually require analog switches in hardware, uh, but they are an interesting attack that's possible with some of the CANT tools. All the ones that are in red are possible attacks to, to employ if you have an SOC that has GPIOs connected to a CAN transceiver. So many SOCs uh, have this configuration where the CAN controller is embedded in the chip. Uh, and then there's an external CAN transceiver that does the differential pair uh, level shifting. And if the pin mux could be reconfigured so that GPIOs are connected to that transceiver instead of the CAN controller, which is almost all SOCs, then all of these red attacks are then possible by software takeover of those nodes. It turns out that um, analogs to these attacks, some of them anyways, are also possible with J1708. So bus flooding and simple spoofing, yep, that's just by creating the data. Um, doing bus off and spoofing immediately is definitely possible with real-time control, as would be an error passive uh, data replacing style attack. So um, let's talk about some of the public attacks in the literature. We'll talk about 10. Um, each result is true only on a specific model or year of a particular truck, so your mileage may vary, but they're worth testing if you have access to a truck. First up is vehicle disable or limp by a DEF, DEF additive message manipulation. So the DEF is the, uh, the additive that's added to diesel to make it burn cleaner. Uh, so Urban Johnson back in 2015 proposed this. The way the trucks are set up by regulation, uh, when there's failures in the additive control system, the DEF levels, for example, the truck has to actually eventually enter a limp uh, mode, which where it's going very, very slow, uh, almost completely useless. So by manipulating those DEF levels, uh, if you had access to the segment where they were being sent, you could actually cause a vehicle to disable. Uh, to dial of ECUs is possible. So Subujit um, et al demonstrated this back in 2016. Um, they were actually able to exploit a weakness in the data link layer protocols of 1939-21. Uh, they demonstrated there was actually a practical denial of service attack in these systems. They're, they're practical because they were actually later demonstrated on real vehicles. Uh, crafting the attacks did require studying the workflow of the data link layer and identifying points that were suitable for disruption. There were actually three categories of DOS that are identified. There was a request overload, there was false RTSs, and there was connection exhaustion. There's more vehicle disables and limps uh, that are possible. This is some uh, research that was performed by um, CAN bus hack, sponsored by the NMFTA. And they actually identified a whole family of message types that can possibly lead to a D-rate event, and hence also a limp mode. So what's more, they created a very simple fuzzing-like attack, kind of a search through the proprietary message space that was demonstrated to find and cause D-rate events with a known investigation or reverse engineering, sorry, no reverse engineering required. And they also demonstrated that the D-rate events could be caused by reconfiguring the calibrated limits that are stored in the engine components, um, which underscores the importance of diagnostics security. There's more details on uh, this attack, which is pretty recent at our portal, CTSRP and MFTA org, seen there in the link. What about J7281587? And this is also in the category of abusing diagnostics. Uh, Haystack and Six Volts uh, delivered a talk here at the Car Hacking Village in DEF CON 24. And in it, they included an example of how you could actually disable 
a truck ECM by misconfiguring it. And they did this by um, doing some protocol and software reverse engineering of 1708 traffic and to demonstrate that there were no access controls on what needed to be sent uh, from the diagnostics software to create bad engine configuration. So in addition to physical access uh, being required, they also highlighted that compromise of the diagnostic software would in fact be sufficient. Uh, remember the diagnostic software is highly privileged, is usually just Windows software running on a Windows PC in a maintenance bay. What else can you do? Um, it's possible to override the instrument cluster display. I think lots of people have done this playing with um, instrument cluster setup on benches for pass cars. The same thing is possible in uh, heavy vehicles as demonstrated by um, Liza, Burakova, Bill Haas, Leif Millar, et cetera. More by uh, Liza and Bill's team. You can actually do RPM control and engine brake disable. Uh, not only were they able to disable the engine braking, uh, but over 1708, they found that they could disable cylinders, the particular truck they were testing. And this was done via legitimate diagnostics functionality, similar to what Haystack and Six Volts presented previously. Um, they also were able to cycle ABS air release. And they noticed um, that they could do this by replaying diagnostics, diagnostic tool traffic that was unauthenticated. Uh, and what's interesting is that the same functionality is also present on J2497 networks, which maybe isn't surprising since that's just J1708 over power lines. Uh, so last up is reading remote traffic from J2497. We mentioned this in the, the technicals of J2497. So we, we did find that you could cycle the uh, ABS pressure valves, but um, when you're just reading traffic, it's possible to get it from six feet away. And this was published as CISA advisory um, uh, last year and also got a CDE. So in summary, there's plenty of things you can do both in 1939 1708 and 2497, but there's more and we would like you to give it a shot. Uh, so what actually needs more hacking? Well, abuse of the legitimate stuff is probably a good place to start. So no, no exploitation needed. Take some diagnostic software and, and see what can actually be replayed. It's a good place to start. Uh, we have seen several examples of fruitful abuse so far, but there hasn't been much um, in terms of abusing ADAS features or mobilizer or body control. Uh, so some things to think about. There's also definitely research needed into vehicle network gateways. So gateways being the devices that are going to bridge multiple CAN or J1939 segments in the vehicle. Sometimes they're being introduced for performance reasons. Um, but whether they're being introduced for performance reasons or not, they're always a security relevant device since uh, they connect multiple segments and pivoting is possible. So those could use some sunlight as well. Uh, what other truck and trailer hacking can you do? Well, just like car hacking, you know, truck hacking is really the Olympics of hacking, which is a quote attributable to Will Caruana. Uh, all the usual IoT stuff is there, uh, game hacking as well. Telematics is pretty much IoT devices. Uh, all the mobile handhelds and head units and um, logistics devices are all Android. The diagnostics and maintenance tools are usually just you know, not very high quality Windows software, although that is getting better. And of course, RF, there's lots of RF all over the trucks and RF is usually, you know, whatever you got, whatever you want to try. So there's definitely a place for you to get involved. Um, if you're a professional or a student that wants to get involved, definitely recommend the Cybertruck Challenge. This is an event that's put together specifically to train students. Uh, it does get attended both by industry experts as well as the students um, and OEMs and suppliers. Each student that attends pretty much gets more than $10,000 in free training. There is a stipend for students that are eligible. There's going to be stuff to crawl under and over in the form of trucks and boxes. Uh, and I do encourage you to participate. Of course, and this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone watching the videos, you can definitely get involved through the Car Hacking Village. Uh, this year, we're going to have some more air brakes setups, uh, launching some Nerf darts for fun if you want to join and try. Uh, if you want to get involved, I highly recommend doing a bench setup. This is definitely necessary in this field because getting time on trucks is hard. Um, as we mentioned, if the trucks aren't rolling, the fleets aren't making 
any money, but you can make a truck in a box uh, looking at Haystack and six volts uh, paper that's available on GitHub. And for all the really gory details, you can check Jose's master's thesis, which is available at the University of Tulsa. Let's move on to some technical stuff and talk about tools for truck hacking or just vehicle networks in general. So if you're on a JNAC Ethereum network and you got some traffic flying by, um, you want to know what it is that you're looking at. In a passenger car, you might need to try to get your hands on a DBC file that defines all the bit fields and what they mean and maybe what the arbitration IDs are supposed to be. In the case of J1939, uh, most of this is standardized. And if you had a copy of the J1939 digital annex, you could go and uh, decode it yourself. There is a nice tool that we've developed called Pretty J1939, which takes that digital annex converts it into a J1939 JSON file uh, and is able to use that JSON database to decode the J1939 traffic. The tool is also compatible with uh, lots of previous versions of the J1939db.json format that you may find floating around on the interwebs. So if you have one of those JSON files, you're in luck, you can use it. Uh, remember though that your decode is only as good as the DB that you use with. So um, previous versions didn't actually capture all the details of JNIT39 accurately. So the best quality will be obtained by purchasing the digital annex and converting it. Um, the output that you see here is showing how you can augment the can dump format with commented JSON objects. You can also omit the can dump stuff on the left and just put out a, a sequence of JSON objects. That format with just JSON is very useful for filtering and beautifying with something like uh, JQ requiring the JSON. Uh, the CAN data you see here is from the Colorado State Public CAN data logs. And so is the VIN of the truck that they own there. What about sending J1939? Uh, you can do that using socket CAN and you can do socket CAN on a truck duck. So the truck duck was introduced here at the Car Hacking Village in DEF CON 24 by Six Volts and Haystack. It's the blue one pictured on the left. Since then, they've put up together some more versions like the 1.5 Yeet, which is green, and that mega board, which is blue next to it. Uh, also pictured here on the right is my truck Cape, which is a truck duck remixed by Dr. Daly. And it's in my uh, custom monogrammed laser case, which I'm very proud of. You can also see the SMA connector sticking out of it, which I use for J2497 research. You can send J939 using uh, socket cam. So here is a snippet of some Python. Uh, you need to use sock raw in most cases. Um, it won't send frames with transport for longer data. So you'll have to do your transport breaking up yourself, but there are other tools we'll talk about. Um, and this does let you put together programmatically. Uh, we're showing a hex up here. You have to uh, use, you don't have to use struct pack, but you can see the struct pack example. There's um, some patches that are necessary for using other features of J1939, and we'll talk about that a bit in a second. Um, if you want to know more about what's actually happening in this snippet where address claim messages are being put together, I recommend you check out the presentation at our portal by Dr. Daly, uh, and you can see some of the sample code at Dr. Daly's um, GitHub link there. So there's lots of alternatives to sending J1939. Um, since Linux 5.4, there actually is a new socket CAN type, CAN J1939, which can be used uh, since CPython 3.9. So as long as you're above that, you can go direct to CAN J1939 for your socket type instead of using CAN raw like we saw in the snippet. Uh, that is how Haystack put together the truck duck uh, for PyHV networks. Um, but wasn't actually, but that was done in a backport, so it isn't available in mainline until much more recently. There's a lot of different kind of semi-dead or semi-active uh, Python things out there. The one that seems to be the most actively developed is Python CAN G1939 linked here. That one uses CAN raw, so it will be workable on more systems than just the most recent patched Linux kernels. The API that it has there is best suited for developing J1939 ECUs, but I'm sure it would still be fine if we're putting together messages that you want to send. All that to say that um, socket can isn't the only way to send J1939. There are other tools such as the can cat and the truck devil, which are great at sending uh, J1939. We'll talk about those as well. 
So let's move uh, to J1708 and 1587 and 2497. You can decode all these networks using the pretty J1587 tool. So this is the tool that will take the SAE PDF of J1587 and J1708. It'll convert them into a database. And then if you feed it uh, frames from J1708 or any of the other two networks we mentioned here, it'll actually do the decoding. This was presented last year by Dan Salom and Thomas Hayes uh, here at the, C at the CHV. Uh, the data you see here is actually from a couple attempts at launching the Nerf darts last year. So this was by Ulox. He gave it a shot. Uh, spoiler, neither of these worked, but it, it was a good idea. What about uh, sending data? So you can do that using the J1708 send uh, on a truck duck. Uh, some hardware modifications are required, and for details on that, see the, see the GitHub as well as the talk last year. Um, right, and that's not the only tools. Uh, we mentioned this earlier. There's non socket can options such as Truck Devil and CanCat, which are great tools for putting together your own can frames or even receiving your own can frames for 1939. Uh, the Can Matrix tool is great for converting between different database formats. It actually has a basic J1939 DVC that's available in it. Uh, GRJ2497, developed by Chris Poor at AIS, it actually does 2497 decoding on SDRs. The PyHV Networks Library by Haystack and Six Volts uh, does J1708 sending as well as J1708 receiving. And of course, um, USB links and DPA4s. So first up is the Truck Devil by Hannah Civil, Silva. Uh, it actually does decoding and logging and sending. Uh, it works on the Machina M2. And there is a really cool fuzzer that's in development. Hannah put together training videos, and these training videos for the Truck Devil are also available on our portal, uh, CTSRP and MFTA org. The CanCat, which is developed by Atlas, uh, uses a custom firmware for the M2, uh, and it has its own client, which includes J1939 support. The, uh, the CanCat is developed much like a lot of Atlas's stuff, which is an uh, interactive Python REPL. So if you're into programming at a Ripple, this might be for you. And of course, CAN Matrix. Don't forget there is a basic J1939 DBC in the CAN Matrix by Edward Broker. 2497 receiver by Chris Poor at AIS. This is freely licensed if you want to use it. It has flow graphs and custom blocks and it will let you read J2497 traffic if you have an SDR. PyHV Networks um, is pretty much the only way to send J1708 and 1587 traffic using open source software. It works only on the truck duck at this point anyways. So if you need to send J1708, J1587 traffic, you're gonna to wanna to head to this. Um, having open source software and open source hardware isn't your only option. Uh, when you're dealing with trucks, you're gonna run into OEM diagnostic software. It's a really good idea to have what are called vehicle diagnostic adapters. And these are, um, they let you plug into the vehicle, but they also have a standardized programming interface, DLLs in fact, that are specified by RP1210. So having an RP1210 VDA really lets you use any of the OEM software. The Nexa USB link in particular is cheap and easy to find. There are definitely ripoff versions that you can find on less reputable sites, but we of course recommend that you buy the real one. The Nexa USB link original, not two, uh, not the version two, actually has a DB15 connector, which we highly recommend because there's a lot of cheap cables and adapters for DB15 as opposed to some of the newer stuff that moved to DB25 and other higher density connectors. Similar vein is the Digitech DPA4, also RP1210 compatible, also has a DB15 connector, which is really useful. Um, the DPA5 does not have the DB15 connector, although it's also a really great adapter. The drivers for both of these DPAs include a really useful data logging feature. Uh, they call it debug file, but when you turn it on, you get a dump of all the traffic going on on all the buses on the diagnostic adapter. So I hope we covered everything we wanted to cover uh, in review. I hope I convinced you that commercial transportation is important to everybody. Uh, I showed you that trucks have three main types of vehicle networks. Two of all of these, uh, two of these vehicle networks are found on all the trucks in North America. Uh, we did a survey of all the public hacks of trucks by a host of a bunch of people that are waste money, which is definitely room for more. And I showed you how you can get involved in a, a whole bunch of different ways. So, you know, virtual transportation is important and I hope that this talk has convinced you. 
Lastly, um, our program, the Commercial Transportation Security and Research Program at the NMFTA is always open to collaboration. Uh, we fund as well as uh, collaborate directly on a variety of topics, including vehicle security office and, and defense, which you saw in this talk. Uh, we're also interested in back-end system security, distribution and service center security, and uh, both mainframe and mid, so IBM Z and IBM I security. If you are interested in collaborating on a particular project or idea, please uh, do reach out to us. We're always looking for great, smart people to work with. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I'll be available in Discord for questions and I'll see you around the con. Bye.